Hello, my name is Jamie. Welcome to the second session out of four of the Science Trailblazer speaker series. Today we have one of the leading businesses in the world of Western Ontario by this wonderful thing called the internet. In our audience, the school's most inspired students from the science program are here. The next hour hopefully promises to be full of insight and wisdom about the world we live in, and which surprisingly is the same world that Dr. Neil Turok studies and works in. Ah. Now, a note on the structure of the event. After Dr. Chirot speaks, there will be a Q&A session for about 10 minutes. It's all relative. If you wish to speak individually with Dr. Chirot, uh, come to the microphone after the thank you bit um, while everyone's leaving. You may have an extra 5 to 10 minutes connected. Now, I'd like to invite Nicola here to provide an introduction to Dr. Chirot. Okay. Thank you, and good afternoon, Dr. Chirot, teachers and students. My name is Nicola. On behalf of Burnaby South Secondary School students, Welcome to Burnaby, Dr. Tura. For your information, Burnaby is home to just over 220,000 citizens and eight secondary schools. Our school is approximately 1,700 students. Dr. Tura has had an amazing career and is now the director of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, which is a scientific research organization working to advance understanding of physical laws and to develop new ideas about the essence of space, time, matter, and information. He is a world-class scientist who has played important roles at Princeton University and the University of Cambridge. He was selected by CBC to give the Massey Lectures in 2012, which raised public awareness uh, about major scientific breakthroughs and argued that the world will soon undergo a quantum revolution that will replace the current digital age. When I was 13 in 2012, I had the privilege of listening to Dr. Turek's What Bank Nazi Lecture at UBC Chan Center on the origins of the universe and of briefly meeting him afterwards. I felt enlightened to have been in the presence of such an eloquent and influential speaker and scientist. Dr. Turek inspired me to learn about physics and has inspired many students who pursue, who pursue physics in school, and I'm sure today will inspire every student in this room to think more about the world around. Because Dr. Turok's wish is to find the next Einstein in Africa, he has founded many postgraduate set centers across Africa to support math and science. And each summer, he runs the International Summer School for Young Physicists for two weeks for high school students. Today, we, ex we will be exposed to elements of quantum physics, cosmology, and perhaps ideas for a career in science. Please join us in a warm welcome for our special guest, Dr. Turok. So, very happy to meet you all. Uh, I remember my visits to BC very fondly when I came to give the Massey Lecture and I think the other lecture that was mentioned. Uh, BC is a wonderful place and I especially enjoyed meeting the young people at the University, at the University of British Columbia, uh, who were incredibly enthusiastic about physics and wouldn't let me leave when I went to talk to them and followed me all the way out of the campus and uh, wouldn't, let me, uh, wouldn't let me go home. But, uh, so that was great to see. I hope you're going to be similarly enthused. Um, so let me talk a little bit about physics and where we are. Uh, I have a blackboard behind me. Uh, you can probably, can you tell me if, uh, if you can read this? Is that, that's readable? Very good. So I'm going to tell you about three things. Okay, big, small, and quantum. <clears throat> These are the three frontiers of physics today. Um, and in each case, uh, revolutions are happening. Um, this could not be a more exciting time to do physics. Um, it's certainly the most exciting time for the last 30 years because most of these developments we're seeing have been 30 years in the making. So let's start with the big. What's the biggest thing you know? The stars? Well, a star is quite big, but the universe is a lot bigger. And uh, do you know what the size of the universe is? Size, 
the universe we can see, how big is it? So this is 10 to some power meters. What's what's the power? Can you guess? So it's one with a certain number of zeros after it. And how many zeros? So 10 meters? 100? No? Okay, it's 10 to the 25 meters. One with 25 zeros after it. It's a big place. And uh, not only is there our solar system orbiting the star, the sun that we live nearby, but there are about 100 billion stars, 10 to the power 11 stars in our galaxy, and there are about 10 to the power 11 galaxies in the universe. Okay, so there are about 10 to the power 22 stars, it's an awful lot of stars, and probably a lot of them have solar systems. So, um, what have, we, what have we learned recently about the universe? Has anybody been following the measurements which have been made on the whole universe, the 10 to the 25 meters? Can you mention a, an interesting experiment or observation that was done on the whole universe? Anything? What's, what's the biggest telescope you know, the most powerful telescope? The which? Kepler. Yeah, Kepler is looking for solar systems, uh, but when I mean big telescope, I mean the telescope that's mapping the biggest things in the universe, the structure on the largest scale. Uh, Kepler is mostly focused in our galaxy, it's just looking nearby, in our neighborhood, at stars which have planets. The satellite which looks the furthest is the Planck satellite. And that has mapped the structure of the whole universe, uh, the whole visible universe, on the largest scales we can see. And what it discovered was uh, very surprising and very beautiful, that when you go to these very large scales, the universe is astonishingly simple. You can describe the structure of the whole universe which surrounds us with one number, okay? We, there's nothing in, in, in your life you can describe with one number, I guarantee you, <laughs> okay? Even an atom requires at least three numbers to describe, the simplest kind of atom, a hydrogen atom. But the structure of the universe requires just one number, and the number tells you how much the universe varies from place to place. So you look out at the sky, you measure the temperature of the universe across the sky, you find it varies very slightly by only one part in 100,000 as you go around the sky. And those variations are showing us what the universe looked like as it emerged from the Big Bang. Because we are looking very far from us, 14 billion light years away. Uh, and as we, we see the universe as it was 14 billion years ago, just after the Big Bang. And what it looks like is amazingly simple. It's almost completely uniform, meaning almost identical in every direction. But there is a small variation of about one part in 100,000 of the density and temperature of the universe from place to place as we look around. So the universe on very large scales is stunningly simple. We have some theories of how the universe formed, how it came out of the Big Bang, but these theories are too complicated. I don't uh, personally believe any of them yet. Uh, we don't have a great theory. More or less we have mathematical models which can fit the observations, but they don't uh, predict exactly what we see. They, don't, they can fit, but they don't really explain what we see. 
Now, on the smallest scale, do you know what the smallest thing we know of in the universe is? What's the very smallest thing that anyone has ever seen? What's the most powerful microscope that anyone ever built? Have you heard it? Uh, I still can't hear it. Thank you. No, uh, it's a good guess. There's, uh, this particular microscope is 27 kilometers around in a giant underground tunnel in Switzerland. It's uh, okay. <laughs> All right, so it's uh, it's called the Large Hadron Collider. Okay, and what did the Large Hadron Collider produce in the laboratory? It produced a certain particle, which we all got very excited about. What? The Higgs boson. Okay, so uh, this, and do you know roughly how big is the Higgs boson? <laughs> it is very small. It's about a billion times smaller uh, than the atom, than an atom. Uh, so the Higgs boson itself would be uh, about 10 to the minus 10 to the minus 18 meters. Okay, so a dot with uh, 17 zeros after it and a one. Um, and that's that's the Higgs boson. Why are we so excited about the Higgs boson? Does anyone know? What's, what, why is it special? If it's just some random particle, who cares? The origin of mass, yes, I, I would say that that's true. It's not just mass, it's, it's electric charge, it's the other properties of particles. Higgs boson is so exciting because it's like, it's a manifestation of the Higgs field. The Higgs field is actually much more interesting. The Higgs field is, is something which is everywhere. So all of space is filled with the Higgs field. It's like the sea, you know, fish swim in the sea, well, particles swim in the Higgs field. It's everywhere. And as they travel through the Higgs field, the Higgs field endows them with their mass and their charge, their electric charge. So it's a very profound thing. The way to see whether the sea is present, I mean, probably most fish don't really think about the sea, uh, the water in the sea. They just assume this is natural, right? Um, probably, you know, they're not really aware of the difference between water and air. But, except when they jump out the water. But uh, we can't jump out of the Higgs field. We're always immersed in the Higgs field. But if we want to tell, we want to verify that the Higgs field is there, the thing we can do is try to excite it. So just like in water, you can make a sound wave by wiggling something around in the water or speaking underwater. You could generate a sound wave to travel through the water. If you um, perform a very high energy particle collision in space, you will excite the Higgs boson and you, the Higgs field, and you will create a sort of sound wave in the Higgs field, and that is the Higgs boson. So if we see the Higgs boson, we can uh, prove to ourselves that there exists a Higgs field filling space. That's why it was so exciting. Um, so sometimes called the God particle, uh, which is an indication of its importance, even if it's not a very scientific word. <laughs> I actually, I know the guy who invented the term, the God particle. 
Um, and, uh, you know, he was a bit of an exaggerator, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> but he did it in order to attract attention to how amazing the Higgs, Higgs boson and the Higgs field are. And they are amazing. Now, this is not uh, the end of physics. Physics speaks about things which are much smaller than the Higgs boson. Okay? In particular, if we ask, where did the universe come from? Where did everything come from? Do you know where everything came from? It came from an event. There was a single amazing event in our past, which, is the, which was the origin of everything. What is it? The Big Bang. And what we call the singularity. Do you know, do you know what we call the singularity? Excellent. Excellent. Great answer. So this is very surprising, right? That all of these hundred billion stars, uh, sorry, hundred billion galaxies, each one with a hundred billion stars, and everything else came out of a point, which is the Big Bang singularity. Um, and many people would say that's where physics ends. You simply can't describe that point from which everything came. Okay? Do you, do you, do you agree with that? <laughs> well, I hope you don't agree with that because uh, the last 15 years of my research has been devoted exactly to that question. Okay, so I am betting that we will understand that point. We will understand what caused the Big Bang. We will understand what happened at the Big Bang. And uh, it is a subject for science. Uh, I would say, you know, even with all modesty, uh, we have come enormously far just in the last 15 years towards understanding what happened at the Big Bang. Now, uh, in terms of small, that's the smallest thing we know of. We know there was a Big Bang. We know everything were, came out of a point okay, in the past. But let's ask how big the point was. Of course, the point is zero. <laughs> a point has no size. So let's try and trace space back to a moment where we can still sensibly talk about space. Uh, so there is a limit. There's a limiting size beyond which it's quite hard, beyond which you need new types of physics. So think of the following. You see, the universe today is full of matter, stars and galaxies, and dark matter, and dark energy. But it also has radiation. It has something called the cosmic microwave background. Cosmic microwave background. Uh, so this is something which fills all of space, again, like the Higgs field, except in this case, it is radio waves. It's, it's waves just like you would find in your microwave oven. But the whole universe is, in effect, a big microwave oven, and, we, and it's, uh, the microwaves are heating us up, but they only have a temperature of 2.7 degrees, uh, Kelvin, that's degrees above absolute zero. So it's pretty cold, but uh, these waves fill space and we can measure them. 
And in fact, that is what the Planck satellite measures. It just, it's, a, it's a device for capturing microwaves. Microwaves are waves whose wavelength is about um, a millimeter to a centimeter. And you need a telescope of roughly that size to capture them. So they have some mirrors which focus these millimeter, centimeter waves into a device which measures them. Um, this cosmic microwave background, you know, why is it important? Well, it's a small fraction of the total energy in the universe today. It's only about um, one ten thousandth of the total energy. But the point about radiation, like uh, radio waves, is that as the universe, you know, a radio wave, if I draw it, looks like this. Okay, it's something traveling along through space. It's made out of electric and magnetic fields, and they travel together through space. The point about it is that as you go back in the past and the universe was smaller, these radio waves would shrink. So today, they would look like this, the microwaves, and at earlier times, they would be smaller and smaller and smaller, and then we would go back to the Big Bang singularity at which those radio waves were infinitely small in wavelength. Now, as you make something smaller, if a wave is smaller in wavelength, it actually becomes more and more energetic. Okay, there's a relationship between the wavelength of a wave and the energy carried by the wave. So, you know this, for example, um, radio waves don't carry much energy. Okay, so if you walk near a radio wave, uh, the generator, you're not going to feel a thing. But if you go near a light bulb, uh, the, the radiation carries more energy. And if you go near an x-ray machine, it's a little bit dangerous and you need to wear shielding. Okay, and if you go even higher to gamma rays, uh, they can do you serious damage. Okay, so and waves get more and more energetic the shorter the wavelength. Now, as we follow this radiation backwards in time towards the Big Bang singularity, these waves get so energetic that something very dramatic would happen. So just imagine I take a little wave in today's universe and I follow it back really near the Big Bang. What do you think it does? It's getting more and more energetic that means it has more and more mass, okay? Because Einstein told us that E equals mc squared. Energy is mass times c squared. So you have more energy, more mass. When you get more and more massive, what happens? What does the wave do? So imagine I've got a particle and I, you know, a particle sitting in that room and I give it more and more mass. It gets heavier and heavier, right? What is it going to do to you as it becomes more massive? It what? Gravity! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you guys are good. I'm very impressed. So um, these waves, as you trace them back in time, would get heavier and heavier they have a stronger and stronger gravitational field until they turned into what? What's, what object has the strongest gravity? Black holes. <laughs> okay. So just before the singularity, these waves would be so energetic and have so much mass, they would form black holes. <laughs> so, the point is, we can't actually even discuss these waves when they've reached that much energy. They're not really waves at all. They're so energetic, they're distorting 
space itself, right? And stopping themselves traveling because they are black holes. That happens, so this is theoretical, it's completely theoretical, we don't have observations, but this tells us these little black holes would form um, on a length scale called the Planck length. It's like the Planck satellite, it's the same Planck, okay? Max Planck was an amazing German physicist who invented quantum mechanics, explained the spectrum of radiation from hot objects, and also discovered the Planck uh, length, this limiting length. Below that length, you can't really talk about space and time because space would become full of black holes. So this Planck length is the smallest length scale we know of in physics. It's way beyond, it's way smaller than the Higgs boson in size. So it's more theoretical, but it's the smallest thing we can conceive of. It's 10 to the minus 35 meters. Okay, so that's pretty tiny. And uh, this is the Planck length. And this is what people like me worry about. What does this Planck length mean? Uh, what happens to the universe when it reaches such huge densities? Or what happened? Uh, we know it happened. So physics has to face up to this, and we have to make theories of how physics works on this scale. Now, something very interesting about the universe is that this huge scale, um, on this huge scale, the universe is incredibly simple. As I said, the whole universe is simpler than an atom. And by that, I mean the structure of the universe on the large scales is extraordinarily simple, requires very few numbers to specify it. So far, the evidence is that, coming from the Large Hadron Collider, that physics on scales smaller than the Higgs boson may also be incredibly simple. Okay? Some theories uh, postulate more particles. As you go to smaller and more, smaller scales, you would have more complicated particles. And so most, people, most uh, theorists were predicting that the Large Hadron Collider will find some more particles, smaller than the Higgs boson. And so far they're wrong. Okay? So far there are no new particles smaller than the Higgs boson. And most theories people have built have been proved wrong in just the last two years. So, but from my point of view, I find this very fascinating that the universe is turning out to be simpler than we expected. And it may be that in fact there, there is nothing beyond smaller than the Higgs boson all the way down to the Planck length. That's a very interesting possibility and we can actually make theories that are like that. So, now what is very intriguing is if you take these two numbers, the extremely large, the extremely small, and then somehow take the average. Okay, now how do I take the average of two lengths? These are both lengths. Something meters and something meters. How do I take those two numbers and get something else which is in meters? Well, I could add the two and divide by two, right? That would be the average. But that's a bit silly because this one is so huge and that one is so small that this one wouldn't make any difference. If I take the average of 10 to the 25 and 10 to the minus 35, it's going to be 10 to the 25 divided by 2. What's another way to take an average? 
that what I just described is called the mean. You know, when you do math, you have the mean of two numbers. You add the two numbers and divide by two. There's another kind of mean where you do something a little bit different, which is more meaningful when you have numbers so widely separated. What else could I do? I want to get a length. So let's say we have two numbers, A and B, and both of them are lengths. How do I get a, a, a length out of this, which represents, in some way, it is in between the two of them? Okay, so I could take A plus B over 2. That would be the mean. There's another thing I can do, which is to multiply them. A times B. But is it a length anymore? If I have A meters times B meters, then it's A, B meters squared. It's an area. I don't want an area, I want a length. How do I get a length from A times B? Yay! <laughs> okay, this is called the geometric mean. Geometric mean, right? I take an area and I take the square root and that's the length. So let's do that with these two numbers. What's the geometric mean of 10 to the plus 25 and 10 to the minus 35? Okay, so we've got to multiply them. Multiply this by that. What do I do? I add the exponents. Right? So I get 10 to the minus 10. Then I take the square root, 10 to the minus 5 meters. It's a length. What's that the size of? 10 to the minus 5 meters. What's something you know that is roughly that size? Something in your body. The cell. Somebody say the cell? Yeah, the cell. That is a living cell. Okay, so the simple picture tells you something very profound about our universe. That, as far as we know, on the tiniest scale, it's incredibly simple. We can figure out the laws which govern it. We're reasonably confident of them. We see no evidence for anything on smaller scales. Um, any between this and the Higgs boson. On very large scales, the universe again is amazingly simple. But in between, on a scale of the living cell, the universe is unbelievably complicated. I mean, you're very complicated. <laughs> We're all very complicated, okay? There's nothing more complicated in the world than people, okay? We're incredibly complicated, uh, unpredictable. Physics knows nothing about consciousness or many aspects of life. It's just too complex, right? Economics, you know, it's not a science because if it was, they would sometimes get the right answer, but usually they're wrong. <laughs> okay, my, my definition of physics, my definition of physics is it is mathematics applied to reality, and when it works, we call it physics. Okay, so when people do financial mathematics or stock markets, it's not very reliable because the whole system is so complicated and relies on psychology and all kinds of other things which we don't understand, not in a quantitative way. So uh, as soon as something becomes trustworthy, accurate, 
describable with numbers and with mathematics, we will call it physics. Maybe one day financial mathematics will be part of physics, but currently it is not. Okay. So, um, so this is where we are. We live in the messy middle, okay, where everything is complicated in the world and, and interesting. At the very extremes of small scales and large scales, the world seems to be extremely simple. So uh, we're still busy trying to understand that. Now, I, I say the best for last because the world is quantum. This is something which was discovered by physicists in the 1920s, a long time ago. And slowly people have come to terms with it. That the world is not what you think it is. Okay? What do I mean by that? We usually think of the world as consisting of objects, like this chair. And these objects have definite positions. Or they might have a velocity. And they interact with each other. But often they don't interact. I'm not really interacting with this chair until it hits me. So we think of the world as a distributed array of objects that occasionally interact with each other. Quantum theory says no. That's not the way the world is. Quantum theory, for example, says that this chair is exploring all of its possible locations all the time. It's not very obvious with the chair because it's a big object and this quantum exploration is very, very slow for big objects. But atoms are doing this all the time and electrons and waves of light and, uh, and so on. What's exciting today is that we have the experimental capabilities now to take advantage of the quantum nature of reality. So we're able to manipulate individual math atoms, individual particles of light, and use quantum, their quantum behavior to design machines, if you like, which are not machines at all. Okay, because you might think of the world as a machine. You know, we, we're, all, we're all made out of stuff, and it's, it, it's uh, moving around and exchanging energy and so on. The quantum world is much more interesting than that. We are, in a sense, exploring all of our possible states all the time. That's why Schrodinger said the cat can be dead and alive. Schrodinger's cat is a famous such example. So just to give you one example of quantum technologies, and I'll point you to a website. Of course, go to Perimeter Institute. We held a conference here. We held a conference here last June called Convergence, was bringing all of physics together. And one of the highlights was uh, experimental work on quantum systems. And so what was described, and you'll, you'll see uh, the lecture by Professor Emmanuel Bloch from Germany, they can use laser beams to create an array. Okay, just like imagine drawing lines in space in a 3D grid. Okay, so you have a bunch of lines and you have some vertical and, uh, and, and also horizontal lines and they intersect on a lattice, a lattice of points in 3D. And then you drop some atoms into the lattice so that each intersection between the lines has an atom sitting on it. And now you start probing the atoms and you allow the atoms to interact with each other. And the whole thing forms a lattice called an atomic lattice, and actually an optical lattice because it's using lasers to hold the lattice together. Using such 
An optical lattice, you can make a clock, an atomic clock, which is accurate, which is so accurate that currently it loses less than one second in the whole age of the universe. Okay, so the universe, the age of the universe is 14 billion years. This atomic lock, clock is so accurate, it, lose, it would lose, uh, it, it's only existed for a year, but it, it loses time at a rate of less than one second in the age of the universe. And these clocks are now getting more and more and more accurate. And so using these clocks, we can design experiments which probe nature at extremely high precision. So for example, uh, we're going to measure soon uh, gravitational waves from black hole collisions. This is going to happen within the next five years. Um, and there are many other uh, you know, great experiments will be done using quantum effects. Does anybody know about you know, some uh, device which people are trying to build now using quantum technology? What kind of device would we be able to build? Quantum computers, yeah, that's a very big uh, attempt. Uh, we all, you know, we all love our smartphones, but this uh, this will be completely obsolete if uh, we get uh, quantum computers. Quantum computers, just to give an example, if you are able to make a quantum computer out of atoms, which is possible by the laws of physics, you would only need 200 atoms each atom acting as a quantum register or qubit. 200 qubits would give you a computer more powerful than all the computers on the world today put together. And you could do it with 200 atoms. Okay, so we are working towards this revolution. Uh, Perimeter Institute, our partner experimental institute called the Institute for Quantum Computing, we don't know when this revolution is going to happen, but it seems to be coming faster than anyone expected. So there's been a lot of progress, and people can already make quantum computers with 10 atoms, but the power grows exponentially. So 10 atom quantum computer, you can't do much. Maybe you can multiply three times five. <laughs> okay, that's about it. But uh, when you get to 200 atoms, you can uh, you 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 will completely transform the world. So uh, these are the three frontiers of physics, and I think uh, I probably talked for too long. So I would love to take some questions. Thanks for listening. Can can I start by asking a question? Sure. You you don't seem to have a teacher. Um, <laughs> I'm very, very impressed that you run this all yourselves. Uh, I think that's wonderful. I'm sure there is a teacher. I'm sure you have a great teacher, but I think it's just great that you're doing this all yourselves. So well done. What is your theory for what occurs inside a black hole? Um, almost certainly it is quantum. Meaning that you shouldn't really have a classical picture of it. You see, so um, maybe let's step back a little bit. We know from nuclear physics that particles tunnel, right? In other words, you have a particle trapped inside a container. The atomic nucleus is a container, and it can trap other particles inside it. And yet, once in a while, the other particles jump out. That's called quantum tunneling. Okay? Basically, in quantum mechanics, you can walk through walls. Particles can walk through walls. Why? Because in quantum mechanics, an object explores all of its possible states all the time. And being on the other side of the wall is a, is a state. So it happens. And we see that experimentally, and that's the explanation for radioactivity. Now let's think about a black hole. 
What is a black hole? Well, a black hole is formed when some matter, for example, a big star, collapses under its gravity. And all the matter in the star uh, gets drawn in by its own gravity and forms this black object from which light cannot escape. That's a classical picture. Okay, it's not the quantum picture. Stephen Hawking showed that what happens in the quantum picture is that particles do escape from the black hole, actually by tunneling. It's the same process as in radioactivity. The particles stuck in the black hole jump out and, and zoom away, and that's called the Hawking temperature. The problem is that Stephen Hawking didn't manage to do a full quantum calculation. He took the black hole to be fixed, and then he studied how particles behaved in this fixed black hole. What I'm trying to do is to do a full calculation where the black hole itself is quantum. And so what you will see is stuff go in, form a black hole. You cannot think of the black hole as a fixed classical object. In fact, it is quantum fluctuating all the time. And then what comes out is the stuff that went in to make the black hole. So right now this is a very active field of research. Uh, different people have different ways of calculating it. Uh, none of them are really successful. Stephen Hawking has changed his mind at least uh, 10 times. <laughs> okay. And he's lost some bets. <laughs> he always makes bets and he generally loses them. Uh, he, 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 he is about to lose a bet with me. <laughs> uh, you will hear about this fairly soon. Uh, I suspect at least within a year, within a year or so, he made a famous bet with me about the Big Bang. And within a year or so, this will be settled by experiments. And he will almost certainly be wrong. <laughs> but nevertheless, his ideas are extremely profound. And he is very creative. And he asks the right questions, even if he doesn't get the right answers always. So um, yeah, the, the evaporation of a black hole, the formation and evaporation of a black hole is a quantum tunneling process. Classically, it's impossible. Classical physics, if you form a black hole, it's stuck and nothing will ever come out. In quantum theory, it, stuff comes out. And what we have to develop is the right ways of calculating it, which will show us exactly what happens. It's very hard, but it's not impossible. And we, have, we think we know what the right laws are. Thank you. For, for the calculation. Does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, do you think that the black hole singularity will happen again, or the universe will reset in some way? Yes. Uh, I, you know, what I think doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, what I think doesn't matter, and I try not to have a fixed opinion, I'm much more interested in learning from the observations and then in building mathematical models which make some prediction. So I am trying to build models which are cyclical, you know, the universe comes out of a bag and then it gets dominated by dark energy and then the dark energy decays and creates another bag. So we can make models like this. I don't yet have confidence in them. But the great thing is that we can test these models mathematically to ask, do they make sense? Uh, do they really, is it really a theory or is it just a, a wish? Uh, and then secondly, we, we can test them with observations. So uh, the observations which are coming are even more powerful than the Planck satellite, much more powerful. When we can detect gravitational waves from the universe, we will literally be able to look directly at the Big Bang singularity. 
We cannot use um, radio waves to do that, or light, because the universe was not transparent to light in its very beginning. Between zero and 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe was opaque. It, it, light couldn't go through it. So we can't now look back and see what happened. But when we can detect gravitational waves, the universe then was completely transparent to gravitational waves. And as soon as we measure these waves, we will be able to literally make a picture of the Big Bang singularity. So this is all coming. It may be in 10 years, it may be in 30 years, we can't be sure. But there, there's no question this is science. We will be able, I believe, we will be able to answer the question, what happened at the Big Bang, using both theory and observations. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, any more questions? Hi, my name is Nicola, and um, my question is, what is an experiment that you have been working on recently, or specific research that you have been doing? Aha! So I don't do experiments. Uh, at all. <laughs> um, I call experimentalists real people. And I, I'm an imaginary person. Okay, so now this is a mathematical joke because when you get to do a little bit more advanced math, you will learn about complex numbers where you have real numbers and imaginary numbers which involve the square root of minus y. So I'm definitely imaginary. Uh, but what I do is I try to encourage other people to do the experiments. Uh, I'm just interested in the ideas. Something I'm working on right now is uh, we just wrote a paper, and uh, you know the wonderful thing about physics is that all of our papers are online. You may have heard, I, I don't want to scare you, but if you but there is a place called the archive. Have you ever heard of that? A R X I D. I have not heard of that. Yet. You've not heard of the archive. Okay, so the point is that physicists create, have created, every technology around us, right? From electricity, water, roads, um, architect use Newton's laws of, of forces to, to build buildings. So physics is always on the cutting edge of technology. When the internet came along, of course, internet was invented by physicists at CERN. And um, soon afterwards, physicists created this thing called archive. And what archive is, it's like a library of all physics papers. So as soon as I write a paper, uh, I will submit it to the archive, and it will appear the next day, and all the physicists in the world are able to read it. Okay, so it's free, um, and uh, that's how physics works. It's pretty amazing. I mean, every day you will see hundreds of new papers appear on the archive, and we all look what's come out today, what's exciting. So if you go and look there, you will find I have two papers in the last three weeks. One of them is called A Perfect Balance. It describes how a universe goes through the Big Bang singularity, mathematically. It's a mathematical model, but it's, it's an exact calculation. I think it surprised a lot of people. We're able to describe mathematically how the universe goes through singularities. That's not the end of the story, but it's it's a beginning. Now we actually have a real theory. It might be wrong, but it's a real theory which predicts how the universe passes through a big bang singularity. The other paper I just put out is is called Shocks in the Early Universe. 
Now you might know what shocks are. You know, when an airplane travels faster than the speed of sound, you get sonic booms, right? There's, there's this bang. That's a shock. That, the, that if you think about sound waves in the air, they're, they're waves, so they look like a sine wave, and they travel through the air like a sine or a cosine. But in real fluids like the air, um, these sound waves can also be so strong that they form shocks. So a shock is not a smooth uh, density pattern in the air, it has sharp edges. And the shock is a place where the density of the air goes from this value to this value in a very short region, very small region. What we discovered recently is that the early universe, very early times, like uh, one billionth of a second after the Big Bang, the early universe had shocks in it under very, very uh, minimal assumptions. We almost had, to, had almost no assumptions in the calculation. We realized that actually, at very early times, there were these shocks floating around in the universe. And if you look at our paper, it will give a link to some movies. We've made some movies of what the shocks look like. And we proposed some observations that if we could detect the gravitational waves produced by these shocks, we would be able to see this process, which happened less than one billionth of a second after the Big Bang. So you can see I work on very extreme project problems. <laughs> um, I always do that. And uh, you know we'll, we'll see if the observations will be possible to test those approaches. But the, the one, one thing I can say is that the experiments, the people who do experiments, always underestimate what they can do. So if I write a paper and I say, hey, you, you know, build this experiment and you will see the signal, almost inevitably they will tell me it's impossible. We can never do it. It's just too difficult. And then 10 years later, they will be doing it. Okay, because technology is going so far, fast. In fact, you in BC have a world-leading instrument just under construction. Do you know its name? It's the mo one of the most exciting telescopes in the world. Also the cheapest. Also the cheapest. It costs $10, $10 million, which is very cheap for a telescope. The Planck satellite costs, I don't know, $500 million, but the telescope in BC is called um, Charlie. Uh, Charlie. It's, it's basically a big radio dish which is going to scan the universe and map its three-dimensional structure. It's a very, very clever idea by one of the researchers at Perimeter. Um, and uh, so this is going to be uh, releasing results in the next couple of years and giving us a picture of the universe. Do you, do you know a place, have you heard of a place called Penticton? Yes. <laughs> That's where it is. Okay, so I encourage you to have a look at this. It's incredibly exciting. That's very interesting, thank you. Hi, Dr. Turoff. My name is Chris. Thank you very much for generously offering your time to the students of Burnaby Self Secondary today. You have provided us with your invaluable insights to your work at Perimeter Institute and in physics and science in general. We would also like to acknowledge the principal of Burnaby Self Secondary, is Chris Manson for hosting today's event at our school. Thank you today, also, thank you also to all the student leaders for facilitating the session and making sure it runs smoothly. Smoothly. <laughs> what really stood out during the presentation for me was the quantum, was about the quantum theory and how it states that 
how an object is always exploring its possible positions. Hi, Dr. Thank you. Uh, I'm Amy, and I think, in general, I will always remember your entire lecture today. It was really great and mind opening. Um, and I'll be, on, on behalf of all the students here and Burnaby student teachers here today, we would like to thank you. Everyone, please join us in applause for Dr. Turok and his presentation. <laughs> 